This renewal has been about prophecies of Jesus Christ. Its purpose is to identify who Christ is. If you think that Jesus is easy to identify, his cousin, according to the flesh, John the Baptist, two times said, I knew not who he was. He's not easy to identify, and particularly in the context of a satanic deluge of Christs that have been proliferated throughout the world and started early on. See, it's necessary that we speak about Christ correctly, that we identify the right Christ, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Well, are you equal to this? Mark, this is the Son of God said this. This isn't Gamaliel. He's not the one saying this. Mark 13, 22, false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall sow signs and wonders to deduce if it were possible even the elect. See, you can't be wrong about Jesus. You can't be wrong about Jesus. There's one Lord. That's all. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father who's above all and through all and in all. Only one. <clears throat> when it gets right down to it, there's really only two men. We would call them theologically the federal heads of a race. The two men are Adam and Christ. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 19, deals with this. It might, maybe perhaps we ought to inform everybody why they die. A lot of people don't know why they die. They think we'd have, maybe your clock just run out or something like that. You die because Adam sinned. By one man, or not two, one man sinned into the world and death by sin. So all men sinned and all men died in death reign because of Adam. And if you wonder whether the human race was sufficiently contaminated by this sin, the scriptures don't enter into a large theological discussion about whether men are totally depraved or not, or whether there's a little bit of good in them or not. It doesn't do this. It just goes right to the end and says, everybody sinned. Everybody dies. So all the haggling, just a lot of waste of time. I tell you right now, when you're born again, God doesn't retain one part of you. He doesn't retain any part of you. You say, what about our bodies? Well, that's going to be changed too. Yeah, you got to know when you talk, hear people say, well, you know, I think there's a little bit of good in everybody. See, they don't understand about Adam. They're confused about Adam. That's what they're confused about. Now, you can't be confused about Christ either. See, in Adam, the seed is bad. We've got a lot of little babies, little infants here. And they're, in it. they're what we call morally innocent. But they're still bad seed. As soon as they grow up, the sin. They're going to have to be born again. And even when they're babies, Jesus still has to die for them because they don't have the kind of nature God has. You know, Christ is the one through whom all this comes. That's why you can't be wrong about Christ. Now, we shouldn't surprise us that there's false Christs. Romans 2.28 tells us there's false Jews. All men are not Jews that are Jews, says. 2 Peter 2, 1 says there's false prophets. Hmm? People say they come from God. They're not really from God. 2 Peter 2, 1 also says there's false teachers. Huh? Most of the time these folk teach from the quarterly, but we'll go into that at some other time. 
They're false. They're not really teachers. In the 2 Corinthians 11, 13 says there's even false apostles. So it shouldn't surprise us that there's false Christs. Now if you talk all false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, false Christs, and you put them all together, here's how God would testify about them. Jeremiah 14, 14. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not. Neither have I commanded them. Neither spake I unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name and I sent them not. Sword and famine shall be in their, this land. They, that they say, sword and famine shall be in this land. Uh, not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. So they get judged even in this world. Now I want to deal a little bit with, about this matter of another Jesus because this has been relatively fresh in my mind. I had never heard a lot of talk about this, another Jesus, but then it is in the Bible. Here's what Jesus said about it, what Paul said about it. Paul was dealing with the Corinthians. It's the worst church in all the Bible was Corinth. Whew, it was a terrible church. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Some people there said there wasn't a resurrection. One guy's living with his father's wife. They're divided all over the place. Divisions among them. They're carnal. He didn't say they were carnal Christians. He said they were carnal. Some assume one another that the law. They were so they were so terrible at the Lord's table, God had to kill some of them and make some of them sick. It was a bad, bad, bad church. But it didn't start out that way. When Paul left Corinth, some false apostles swooped in. And they, they divided that church. And they caused trouble in that church. And Paul wrote them about it. He knew that they had embraced an erroneous Jesus because of their conduct. Because Jesus doesn't produce the kind of conduct they had. The Holy Spirit doesn't produce the kind of conduct they had. The gospel of Christ doesn't produce conduct like that. The holy angels don't minister things that result in conduct like that. So here's what he said. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. I fear... I fear, lest by any means as the servant beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom, ye, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might bear well with them. One person said, you swallow it up. You just welcome it. They come in with their seminars and their workshops and their easy tips and their abbreviated commentaries and they sell them like hotcakes. You can go down to the Bible bookstore and you wonder, where's the Bible section? Am I telling the truth? When you get there, I asked someone, I was buying a Bible for Sister June, I said, where's the Holy Bible at? I found the Dakes Bible, Hagee Bible, T.D. Jakes Bible, Men's Bible, Woman's Bible, Child's Bible, and etc. All of these things indicate another Jesus. Let me tell you, the real Jesus doesn't have a split up section of the scripture. He doesn't divide his word to people and accommodate it to their feeble minds and their minuscule understanding. If you're so dumb you can't understand the Bible, like get smart. Amen. They expect it on the job, don't they? If you don't know how to do your job at work, they say, go to school and find out how to do it. The church says, that's all right. You don't have to learn. Just pick up your collection envelopes and keep coming. Corinth had a wrong Jesus. And they were too tolerant of these people. 
Now listen, I want to establish this before I begin. This other Jesus is a philosophical Jesus. It's not the real one. It's a Jesus of, it's an idea of Jesus. It's not a real Jesus. And this Jesus, this idea, this philosophy, this Jesus that loves everybody as they are, this Jesus wants to come in and help you solve all your problems, huh? This Jesus that your family is the main thing, this Jesus that you're the big item on the agenda, that Jesus can't save. That Jesus can't remit sin. That Jesus can't justify. That Jesus can't produce a new birth. He can't bring you to God. He can't guide you. He can't bring grace to you. He can't bring truth to you. He can't mediate for you. He can't intercede for you. He can't make peace for you. Your baptism is invalid if it's in his name. He can't reconcile you. He can't fill you with the fruits of righteousness. And he can't bring glory to God to the church. It's an impotent Jesus. It's a dawn down people that maybe why Christian people have a lot of difficulty with morality is because they really don't have the real Jesus. Is that possible? That's what Paul said was a difficulty at Corinth. Now, that brings me to my text. This is why we had this series of meetings on the Christ of prophecy. Because if I, Brother Aaron, I believe, brought this out, but if I was to tell you Jesus was born in Rome, you know, you'd say, <laughs> come on now, it says that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's where he was. Or if I told you, I said he's like the third child of an Italian couple. You said, oh, no, 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 no. It says the virgin shall conceive. Whether he was really a Greek. He's born out of the Greek nation. No, no, no. He said he was going to come out of it, Jacob's seed. Well, there's a lot of other things it says about him, too, that are just as true as those are. Now, my message is that Jesus was a prophet to whom the people would hearken. Not should hearken, would hearken. My text is found in Deuteronomy. 18th chapter, verse 15 and 18 and 19. Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses, in his valedictory address, he's getting ready to go home now. He's had this congregation of rebels for 40 years. He said, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, and unto him you shall hearken. Verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now those words must have been precious to Moses. If I were able to call Moses to the witness stand tonight, I'd say, Moses, what are your thoughts about this group of people you've been leading? He'd say, from the day I knew them, they've been a disobedient and Peoples, rebellious and stiff-necked. That's the kind of people there. Did they listen to you, Moses? No, they didn't listen to me. Well, God, what do you think about this, people? You, they're your people. You called them. You led them. You delivered them. You chose them. He'd say, all day long I held forth my people, my, my hands to a disobedient and a gainsaying people. Did they hear you, God? No, he said, they do not know me. There's quite a prophecy I'm reading here. There's a lot of people in the professed church who say, I know, after all, we're like those Israelites. We just don't do what he says. God says to pray, and we don't pray. I mean, you hear this kind of stuff. Is everybody, am I the only one who hears this? 
You know how it is. You know how we are. We just don't want to do God's will. We say, back to Moses. You can't have any part of Christ. Christ will, not, I want to be emphatic here. Christ will not lead people that won't listen to him. You'll just, that's, that's precisely why you get another Jesus. Because God says, I want to send strong delusion to people that don't receive the love of the truth. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. If you don't receive a love of the truth, I mean, where you love it to come out at least twice on Lord's Day, I don't know how you could establish you love the truth if you only take it in an hour a week. Who in the world is going to believe you when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ? I love the truth. Oh, I love the truth. I just don't want to hear it. That's all. Well, let me tell you, that's all you're going to hear in the world to come. <laughs> now let's look at this text. God says, I'm going to raise the prophet up. I'm going to do it. It's not going to be by vote. It's not going to be by consensus. I'm, it's not going to be by request. I'm not going to raise him up because someone asked me to raise him up. This isn't going to be a response to an official committee request from the church. I'm going to raise up this prophet. He's going to be, quote, for the people. In other words, he's the one I want to talk to this people through. If the people don't hear him, like I don't have anything else to say until the day of judgment. And you don't want to wait till then to hear what God has to say. And I'm going to raise him up not only for the people. He says, I'm going to raise him up from the people. You will not be able to tell this is a different kind of person by appearance. It may even be said that you saw nothing in him that you should desire him. It might be said there's no comeliness, see, because people think because they came from him, from them, it's not all that important. It's, oh, we know who he is. He's a, he's Mary's his mother and his brothers and sisters are here. <laughs> we were raised with this fellow. We know him. No, they didn't know him. But they, God didn't have any word. God doesn't have any word for people that don't listen to Jesus. Any word for good. God's other minister is Moses. That's his other minister. And he was going to be like Moses. Handpicked by God. Seasoned. Like Moses was. Leader. Like Moses, Moses was, he did all the stuff. He got the word from God, he led the people, judged the people, settled their differences, told them where the water was, told them where the bread was. He, he kind of handled it all. He's going to be a prophet like Moses. He won't be like Elijah, he'll be like Moses. He'll be like a more thorough, more thorough ministry than the others. And this prophet, remember, this is Moses said, this is the kind of person who's going to come and save the world. This prophet is going to speak what I command him. What, if I tell him to say it, he's going to say it. And the, and the people will hearken to him. Hearken means they'll take heed to him. They'll listen to him, take it seriously. If he says do something, they'll do it. If he says don't do it, they won't. If he says come, they'll come. If he says leave, they leave. If he says sit down, they sit down. Then run, he says run, they run. They'll listen to him. And he said, whoever doesn't listen to him, <laughs> I'm going to require it of him. Amen. He's going to have to explain before an assembled universe why he didn't listen to the one I sent who I told him ahead of time I was going to send. Now, let's a little preliminary, just a few preliminary conclusions here. He raised him up. That is, he'd never have come if God didn't send him. Just the fact that he came is proof of itself that he was sent. This is the kind of man that can't be come in any other way. And another conclusion about this, his coming was not God's res response to our need or his response to our call. I know Job said, oh, that there was a, 
daysman between me and God that could put his hand on. See, he didn't know one was coming. He, I think in his heart he sensed it. Intuitively he knew it because he knew we needed one, but he didn't have a advanced information on that. The whole human race was helpless without this prophet that he said was going to come. This prophet, because he's from the people, would be sympathetic. He'd be able to be touched with the feeling of with the feeling of their infirmities. Now he can't when you sin, he can't he can't be touched with that. He can say, Oh boy, I, you, you committed adultery. I, hey, hey, I know how what that's like. No, he, he doesn't know what sin's like. He doesn't know what sin's like, and he can't be touched with what sin does to you. But he can be touched with a feeling when you feel a tug of it. He knows about that. And he can stop the sin from erupting because he knows that. It's got profit now because he's from the people, see. He's from the people. And he's going to understand them. He's going to, he's going to be able to have compassion. Now, like if Gabriel came down, he couldn't have compassion. <laughs> You know, say you, you just kind of see angel, angelic dealings among men, and they're not compassionate. They just kill 185,000, don't blink an eye. That's the way they are. Thank God we didn't send an angel. They're completely intolerant of these kind of things from men. Now, because he's a prophet, he's going to be noted for what he says. Because prophets are noted for what they say. He's not going to come as a singer. Kind of disappointing to some people, I know, but that's the way it is. He's going to come as a prophet with a word, something to say. And it's going to be a preeminent importance what he says. You can't ignore this. You can't. You say, well, I find this so deep. Well, you better learn how to dig deep because he's not going to tone it down for you. Amen. I know we may have a modern children's version of the Bible, but men wrote it, not God. Am I right? That's, of course, one reason we have preachers and teachers, so they can give the unlearned the sense of what it says. Jesus is, he's going to, he's going to bring understanding because if you don't understand God, you can't get in. So 1 John 5, 20 says, We know the Son of God is come. Some version says, have, has come. See, they're missing the point. The point is that he came and he's still here. That, that's the point. This, we know the Son of God is come and he's still here and has given us an understanding that we might know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. Jesus is, in fact, the expositor of God. <laughs> One place the Lord Jesus was talking to the multitudes. He said, now, all things are delivered to me of my Father. That's the kind of prophet now. That's the kind of prophet. He'll, he says, he'll say everything I command him to say. All things have been given to me and my Father. No man knows the Son. John the Baptist can say, this is right. This is right. Till God pointed him out to me. I didn't know him either. No man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father. Save the Son, and he to, whom, so he to whomsoever he chooses to reveal him. Let me tell you, if God doesn't want to tell, if Jesus does not want to tell you about God, you aren't going to learn. You say, well, what, how, does he, how do we determine who he wants? How do like, we determine who it is that he wants to tell it to? Is it like an arbitrary, we, we, we the eeny, meeny, miny, mo type thing? Or is it picking the odds and even numbers? Or how? Come on, the next verse, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
For I am meek. I, I can teach you. I'm meek. I'm lowly of heart. I can put it down there. You can get it. You'll find rest under your soul. So who will he teach it to? Anybody who comes. So if you may excuse my vulgar talk, if you ain't coming, you ain't being taught. And if you ain't taught, you didn't come. Hmm? How else could you come to any other? Puts it right within your range. Now he said that people will hearken to him. They didn't hearken to Moses. They didn't hearken to Elijah. They didn't hearken to Elisha. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Malachi, Haggai, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, Obadiah. <laughs> but they're going to listen to this one. On them shall the people hearken. Well, now let's. Uh, well, now here, here's the situation. If we've got a people that they're not, what Jesus does isn't happening in them. If we got that, now I'm going to establish what he does. If what Jesus does isn't happening in the people, there's only one or two possibilities. Either the wrong Jesus is there, or the people are the wrong people. I don't know how you could arrive at any other conclusion. Now let's look at this God raised him up. God raised him up. <laughs> raised, this is the openly, the idea is openly. He's not speaking of his resurrection from the dead here that was involved, but that is God raised him up to do something. He's a prophet, but in this case, he's a prophet from heaven, not a prophet on earth. When he came to earth, he didn't come to prophesy. He came to die. Everybody else in the world has been born to live. Jesus was born to die. He told you what his commandment was. Lay down your life and take it up again. So his prophecy is going on in the other domain. Here's what God says about it. God who has sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom also he made the worlds. So he's got the authority of the things he's dispensing, and he's got the authority over the domain in which he's operating. The prophet been raised up. What did God say about this prophet? On the Mount of Transfiguration, you may remember that Moses and Elijah came back from the other world, and Luke says they spake with Jesus about the death of that he would accomplish in Jerusalem. Well, that's interesting because neither Moses nor Elijah said one word about Jesus' death when they were in the world. So how did they learn about that? Did I respectfully dedicate this to all soul sleepers? <laughs> Moses and Elijah picked up some knowledge on the other side. And they talked with Jesus about the death he was going to accomplish. Well, the... Peter, James, and John who were with him up there, Jesus led such a rigorous schedule that they, they fell asleep. What, they weren't bored. That's not why you understand that. They were, they were weary. And they woke up, and just as they opened their eyes, Moses and Elijah, wouldn't you know, are leaving. And Peter speaks up. his Lord, Lord, <laughs> it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you. We'll take turns, go to each of these. The voice spoke out of heaven. This is my beloved son. He said, this is the prophet. Hear ye him. See, now I don't think that this message has gotten across to a lot of professing Christians. I don't think they've ever mastered the art of listening and hearing Jesus. They're too ignorant about what he said. They're too ignorant about what he did. They're too unlearned about the realm from which he operates. This word is still in operation. It's your business to hear him. To be conscious of what he says and conscious of what he thinks and conscious of where he's going 
and sensitive to it. Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What gives it life? Prophetic conferences are worthless if Jesus isn't testifying in them. Jesus further elaborates that all resources have been given to him. This is a prophet who fundamentally speaks, but he does not only speak. He also dispenses the resources of which he speaks. And he dispenses the resources which are required to go where he's leading people. So we read such things as this about this prophet. For the law came, was given by Moses, but grace and truth. <laughs> kind of a summary of all resources. Grace and truth came by Christ Jesus. Notice that the law was given. You got to, it's got a little play on words here. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came. That is, they became accessible. They came within our range, where we could get hold of grace, get hold of truth. We could come into God's favor, where God liked working with us, and we come into the domain of truth where everything is seen plainly. And it all came with Jesus, the one single prophet. Colossians 2, 3 tells us that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him. So if you want, now this is wisdom that it takes to make it to the other side. This is a knowledge that is required to make it safely through the wilderness of this world. See, as Brother Jeremy uh, told us, there's only really two places here and there. That's really the only ones. There's only two times, like now, then. And the whole purpose of salvation is to get out of here and now and up to then and there. I mean, if in the end you go to hell, do you really think it makes any difference, really, what you did? Is anyone in the lake of fire going to be saying... <laughs> Oh, that was really something, what you did back there on the earth. Very, very impressive. See? Jesus is all about getting you safer to the other side. To do that, you have to have resources. Or as Peter said, all things pertaining to life and godliness. And he's, as we mentioned, the expositor of God, knowing God, which is critical because eternal life is, in fact, knowing God. Eternal life's not like a spiritual virus that you get. Sometimes I think people think it's like a virus that kind of bites you and you get some tingly feeling or something, but that's, that's not eternal life. Here it is defined. Jesus defined it. John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they might know the, the only true God in Jesus Christ of now sent. That you're familiar with God. You're acquainted with God. You understand God. You know God. Our sister June and I, we've been married now, she told me, for 26 years. See, we know each other. If you were to ask me, what does Sister June think about the book of Jude? I can tell you. I can tell you. If you were asked for something in the world, like what, she, what kind of a vegetable does she like best, I can tell you, because I know her. She can tell you about me. She knows me. When a person knows God, they can tell you something about him. Someone comes in and says, do you think it's right uh, for me to do this, and you, knowing God? You can say, well, this, uh, this, doesn't, this isn't the kind of thing like you want to be found doing when Jesus comes. You, you know God. See, you understand him. You know the consequences of ignoring them. You know the benefits of giving heed to them. You know that one of the reasons people are going to be condemned is because they don't know God? 2 Thessalonians 1 8 tells us this. In flaming fire is going to take vengeance on them that know not God after that and obey not the gospel. Those people are going to be damned. Doesn't make any difference how nice they were, how good they were. And quite candidly, I'm glad it's this way. I'd hate to get to heaven and find these people there too. I mean, I live around the world, we shop around the world, and such, such. 
But see, God's going to separate us in the separating element, the thing that divides you on a practical level from the ungodly is you know God. <laughs> now let's look at the fact he said, the, and the people will hearken to him. They will, they will hearken to him. They'll listen to him. <coughs> Now, Jesus taught quite a bit about this. It's kind of astounding, but, but this is the truth. Jesus taught us that his sheep hear his voice. Remember now, Moses said, Unto him shall the people hearken. That's what he said. All right, I hear Jesus steps to the witness stand. Here's what he says, John 10, 4 and 5. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. And they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not his voice. Well, you say, I'd like to have a little further elaboration on that. John 10, 8, all that ever came before me are, not were, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Here, John 10, 16, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, as Gentiles, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Here's John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Well, that's, well, that's actually pretty plain. I don't know how that could be any plainer. I, you, might, you might find a simplified version but, uh, of the scriptures, but you're going to come up with this conclusion that my sheep hear my voice, and that means if they don't hear his voice, they're not his sheep. They're not saved. They're not Christians. They're not part of the church. They're not. Because this is a test. Do you hear? Do you not hear? And remember, he raised them up from among the people, so it's, he's within hearing distance. It's not that people just can't hear because there's too big a gap. Oh, no. He's been brought down to this domain, and he now speaks down to the earth from heaven. Jesus said something else about him along these lines in John 8, 47. He said, They that are of God... Hear the words of God. So if someone says, we really, you know, we like, we like all what's going on, but I mean the sermons are rather long. We, we, we'd like to give a little more time to praise, if you don't mind, and, and cut down a little bit on hearing this about, because it's, frankly, I feel better when I'm praising than when I'm hearing. Oh, you do. You got a real problem if this is the case. Because faith comes by hearing, not by praising. Do I, am I right? Amen. The prophet's not known for singing, he's known for speaking. So Jesus isn't going to sing a little ditty in your ear, and all of a sudden you get holy. That's not the way it's going to work. He's going to speak to you and your mind's going to have to process what he says. You're going to have to exert yourself to believe what he says and to get a grip on it because the words he speaks are spirit and they are life. In fact, when Jesus raises people up in a new birth, he does it by speaking. This is John 5, 25 and 26. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now, the, he's not speaking about the resurrection of the dead for the next verse. It says, don't marvel at this. He tells you the graves are going to come be empty. So he's not talking about resurrection of the body from the grave. He's talking about a spiritual resurrection. And here's how he does. He says, now the Father has life in himself. That means he can give life. He, he can confer life. And he gave the ability to Jesus in the capacity of the man Christ Jesus, see, in his humble <laughs> capacity, he gave him the ability to confer life. And here's how he confers life. He speaks life into you. 
so that if you don't hear, you stay dead. Hmm? In fact, God's election, and God is an elector. I know some people say, well, I don't believe in that. Well, like, who cares? You think we care whether or not you believe in election or not? Do you, re you want to argue about this? We just bury you. You'll be ashamed. You'll be ashamed to stand before God and try and start and argue about this. Somebody's got to make the choice. You ought to be glad it's God. Amen. Now, your election is confirmed by hearing this voice. Here's how Paul put it, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 6. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, I, I, I know it, not because God said the Thessalonians are elected. That's not how he knew. For our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of God in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. That told him, said, God chose these people. Say, when did he do it? That's not even the issue here. I could talk about it, but that's not even the issue here. You will not go to heaven if God does not want you to go. And if you hear the Son, he wants you to go. So you stop trying to philosophize about when he elected and start listening. Then whether you understand it or not, you get in because you heard. Well, here it is again in Ephesians 1, 12, and 13. Remember, he's a prophet, so I'm showing you the, this, through this word that the new birth is initiated. Ephesians 1, 12, and 13, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So there was condition, no, nah, it wasn't conditioned upon a routine that you followed. It was conditioned upon you believed what was said. You say, well, what's the difference? The difference is when you believe what's said, you'll do anything he tells you to do. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Everybody, in, like the eunuch said, here's water, what hinders me? He says, the only thing to stop is if you believe. Didn't tell him what to believe, huh? Didn't tell him what to He didn't say, repeat after me. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's it. That's it. Good enough. And he baptized him into Christ. See, it's your response to the gospel. Do you connect the gospel with you being saved? When, when this gospel comes across the sea of time and the difficulties of life, is there like a ring in it that says, this is for me? This is for me. This is the way out. It's out of here and into there. This is it. Yeah, that's how we know that you're a sheep. That's how we know. We don't guess at it. And when you look at us, you don't guess at it either. Let's have some evidence here. The people will hearken to the prophet. That's what he said. Salvation is by means of a message. Not a strategy. A message. Here it is, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. We are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. He's the one who got you ready, convicted you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Huh? Got you ready to obey through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So salvation comes through this call. And I want to just, uh, I'm going to have to hasten here, so I want to give it three examples of hearkening to show you if you don't pay attention to what Christ says. <clears throat>
we really don't offer any hope to you. You remember when Jesus was at a wedding feast at Cain of Galilee? Cain of Galilee? And as a festive occasion, his mother came to him and said, they're out of wine. They're out of wine. And Jesus, of course, he, he backed off a little bit from this. He said, woman, you know, what have I to do with thee? My hour's not yet come. If I'm not come here to, <laughs> I didn't come down here to give people wine. But I'm going to convert this occasion into a, a thing that will glorify me. So he, he looks at those servants. There's six large water pots they are used for cleansing. All right, now remember, the prophet to whom the people will hearken, he said, fill the water pots. Do you think anybody would have got wine out of those pots if they didn't fill them? Do you realize how many people are trying to get benefits from God and they never put water in their pot? They don't have an ear to hear, and they're still expecting to get a lot of great benefits from God. You got to, I'm showing you, they hearken. They didn't say, How come? Folk have already washed their feet, don't need any more water. They filled them up. Here's another case Jesus comes to the synagogue. It's a man with a withered hand in the synagogue. And the people in the back appears as though they planted this guy in the synagogue to see whether Jesus would do anything for him. So Jesus looks on him, he looks on the people, he gets angry at them. And after he addressed a scathing word to him, he said to this man, remember now, the people are going to hearken to the prophet. He says, stretch forth your hand. I mean, this is a withered hand, folks, actually a withered arm, we'd call it. To see, what could this fellow do to stretch out his hand? He could try. And he did. <laughs> he hearkened. <laughs> you think it was any harder for that man to stretch out his hand than for you to quit some of the things you need to quit? Do you? You think it was any harder for him to stretch out his hand than for you to see a ray of light in the trouble you're in? Hearken to the word of the Lord. How about this with this epoch? Jesus stands at a door of a tomb. His friend Lazarus is in there. Been in there four days. Mortification set in. Jesus says, roll the stone away. Roll it away. Martha says, Master, I mean, he stinks by this time the older. <laughs> this man hasn't been to church in a long time. <laughs> hmm? I don't, I don't think we ought to bring him in. <laughs> I don't think we ought to bring him in. I think it's been too bad. He's backslid a long way. Jesus said, Lazarus. Remember now they hearkened to the voice of the prophet. Come forth. Now it wasn't easy for Lazarus to come forth. He is bound hand and foot, what it says. And a napkin around his face, he can't see. And <laughs> How? You think you got your problems, huh? Here he comes. Huh? He hearkened. He hearkened. Jesus said to the brethren, loose him and let him go. That's what our job is. Get on out of that circumstance and we'll help you. We'll loose you and let you go. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, that they'll hearken. To the words of the prophet. I showed you where he said the sheep here. Then I showed you these practical matters that could have been multiplied many times. They hearkened. Now remember Moses said, <coughs> Moses said that whoever doesn't hearken to this prophet, it will be required of him. Now Peter refers to this prophecy. But he's not as gentle as Moses was. It's Acts 2, or Acts 3, 22 and 23. You of your brethren like unto me. Him ye shall hear. That's Matthew 7 13. Straight, straight. This is not S T R A I G H T, which means like a straight line. It's straight S T R A I T, which means hard, narrow, difficult, inconvenient. 
You may have to get to Canaan through a desert. <laughs> you may have to get promoted after you go to a lion's den. You may find favor after you've been in a furnace of fire. You may have to go to prison for almost 13 years before you get seated on Egypt's throne. See, you, the straight gate, don't seek the convenient way. Don't, if you're a church, don't tailor your service for disinterested people. Hang a sign out there that says, disinterested people, not welcome. Maybe someone come and say, hey, what's that?